Okay, welcome back to another rock video series with me, Sean Wilsey, here at the Evergreen Building at the College of Southern Idaho uh, in my classroom here. And our video series today is going to focus on the igneous intrusive rocks. Um, now, I will admit fully up front that this is definitely uh, my weakest group of rocks in terms of knowledge base and the things that I have to share. But nonetheless, hopefully this will be helpful and instructive for some of you. Um, we'll start with our normal notes and then I'll show you a few samples. But again, I'll, ad I'll admit my uh, lack of knowledge in this area is definitely stronger than uh, some of the other rock types. So uh, that's why I've chosen to lump all the intrusive rocks together. Another geologist uh, with more knowledge would probably be dividing out the granites and the cyanites and the phonolites and all sorts of things. Um, but we're just going to cover this for today and hopefully you'll find it helpful and instructive. So these are the igneous rocks that form underground. This is what happens when magma cools and solidifies below the earth's surface uh, slowly. And these are sometimes also called uh, the platonic rocks. So these are also sometimes called plutonic rocks because they do form uh, these igneous intrusions, sometimes known as plutons, which we'll look at here uh, in a bit or talk about a little bit as well. Um, so remember that in the real world of uh, quantitative geology, that igneous rocks are actually defined and described and identified based on the mineral compositions they contain. Now this is hard to do when you're out in the field just wandering around looking at rocks and trying to figure out what's what. Um, typically what you need to do is then bring your sample back to a lab, analyze a specific area, determine the percent composition of each mineral, uh, and then take it to one of those ternary diagrams, those triangular diagrams uh, that I talked about in the first kind of intro to rock video. And that's how you end up figuring out specifically what type of rock you have. Uh, but we're going to employ, because of my skill set, which again is, is somewhat limited in this field, we're going to employ what I like to call the Wilsey way, just a much more generic approach. Something that hopefully though will be helpful to you as you're looking at rocks in the field or perhaps looking at rocks in your collection. Um, but this is by no means a hardcore way in terms of igneous petrology to approach this groups of rocks. I'm, I'm much more knowledgeable with the volcanic rocks, the extrusive rocks, uh, than I am the intrusive rocks. So uh, we're still going to use some of those same uh, compositional terms that we learned a few videos ago. So felsic, uh, meaning minerals uh, that are typically lighter in color. So remember your felsic minerals are quartz, uh, potassium feldspar, spar, or what we like to call K-spar, plagioclase feldspar or plage, and then muscovite. And then at the opposite end of the spectrum, the mafic minerals are biotite, amphibole, pyroxene, and olivine. So we're going to look at these rocks in terms of the minerals they contain, but we can also talk about the, the whole rock itself using these terms. This is a reflection of the original magma composition that forms the rock. So felsic magmas that have higher amounts of silica will tend to crystallize and form rocks that have mostly felsic minerals in them. And so they tend to be lighter in color they have more felsic minerals than they have mafic minerals. Intermediate, as the name implies, is kind of right down the middle, maybe a 50-50 split or something similar to that. We've talked about textures before in our Intro to Rock series, so if you need to go back and review that, please do. But the main textures we're gonna see with our intrusive igneous rocks are gonna be phaneritic textures. So again, that's crystals you can see, generally more than a millimeter in size. And the other important distinction here is that those minerals are all interlocking. They're all squished together, kind of forming a mosaic. Uh, there's no real space between the crystals. They're probably about the same size, although there can be a little bit of variation in size. And that's where the other term porphyritic might come in handy, although this is a little bit more rare with our intrusive igneous rocks. Porphyritic, remember, is when we have large crystals, maybe crystals that are 10 times or more larger than the rest of the crystals. We have a distinct difference in crystal sizes. So we're mainly going to stick with the phaneritic texture. Um, the igneous, the intrusive igneous rocks are somewhat characterized by having well-formed crystals typically 
at least early on. So as this magma is crystallizing, uh, the first minerals that crystallize, because they have space and there's no, uh, you know, uh, other crystals pushing on them or encumbering their formation, those crystals will tend to be very well formed. So they're going to form about as perfectly as they can. And we call these types of crystals, if you need some fun words for the day, euhedral. So euhedral crystals are well formed. They're geometrically uh, correct. You know, if it's a if it's a hexagon, it's going to be a hexagon, um, but it has the, the the corners and the faces and the facets you might expect from whatever mineral crystal is forming. When we get to minerals that are forming later, remember at this point, crystals have already formed. These pretty euhedral crystals have already taken up some space. And so these late forming minerals are just stuck with whatever remaining space there is. And so they tend to be less well formed. So their shapes and their crystal geometric forms will tend to be a little bit more irregular. And we sometimes call these uh, less than perfect crystals anhedral. There's actually an intermediate form called subhedral as well, but that gives you some, some fun definitions and some words that uh, you might kind of go with. Uh, and then finally for this sheet, um, I'm not going to go over these, but you maybe are familiar with some of these features. Uh, one thing to note about intrusive igneous rocks is that when they ultimately cool and crystallize, they form uh, a myriad of uh, different igneous landforms, so dikes, sills, plutons, batholiths, stocks, lacoliths. The list probably goes on and on, but I just picked a few you might have heard of before. So it's noteworthy to just remember that these intrusive igneous rocks uh, in aggregate can form some pretty interesting features uh, on the landscape and in the subsurface. So I'll let you look these up if you're interested in adding these words to your lexicon. So um, let's go to one more page and then we'll, we'll start looking uh, at the rocks themselves. So there are literally dozens and dozens of intrusive igneous rocks. Um, I've chosen four. <laughs> Again, that probably reflects my, my, uh, my knowledge base here, which is somewhat lacking. So we're gonna start with granite. Um, granite is a felsic intrusive rock. So it's gonna have more light minerals than dark. It's gonna be dominated by lighter colored minerals as opposed to the dark little specks in it, which are gonna be a much smaller proportion. In terms of the actual minerals that we need to have in order to call something a granite, and again, if you want to look up the exact percentages, you're welcome to do that. There's, there's definitely deeper dives you can do on this stuff. But it's got to have appreciable amounts of quartz, K-spar, potassium feldspar, and plage or plagioclase feldspar. It's also going to have minor amounts of these. So remember, these three minerals up here, those are felsic. Those are lighter colored minerals, and these are darker minerals. So it, should, it stands to reason then that this is an overall felsic or light colored rock because it's got more light colored minerals than dark colored minerals. Now I'll admit that anything that kind of, you know, looks or smells or even partway, at least in my mind, looks like a granite, I just call it a granite. Um, but more technically, if you have something that's maybe close to a granite but not quite there compositionally, sometimes it's called or more correctly called a granitic rock or even a granitoid. Um, so these are terms you might see as well. But me, I'm a bit of a lumper when it comes to some of these rock types. And so if it's, if I even think it's something near a granite, uh, I'll tend to use that more than some of the other uh, fancy terms. So um, let's keep going through the rock names and then I'll show you the rocks. I think that'll, that'll work well. Uh, so a granodiorite, actually let's skip down to diorite and then we can come up to granodiorite because it's really just a blend of these two. So a diorite is going to be an intermediate intrusive rock. So it's got about equal proportions, 50-50, light and dark colored minerals. I like to call it a, the salt and pepper rock. It kind of looks like a nice blend of uh, both light colored felsic minerals and dark colored or mafic minerals. Uh, some of the essential ingredients in it, it's gonna have plage, that's gonna probably be the dominant light colored mineral that you see in a diorite. Plage usually presents itself in rocks as, in these rocks anyway, as being white. Uh, it'll have some amphibole, usually for sure, and some per pyroxene. So these will be the darker minerals that you might see. And I'll let you go back and look at some of our previous videos into how you differentiate these two. It's mainly uh, cleavage planes, but also color, a little bit of a color variation there as well, typically. And then it might have a little bit of biotite, a little bit of quartz as well. But that's our intermediate intrusive rock. Um, if we kind of come back up here a little bit, we can look at granodiorite. So this is going to be obviously in between granite and diorite in terms of its composition. The name kind of says it all, right? So it's going to be a little bit more mafic than granite. It's going to have more dark colored minerals than a granite, but not up to the 50-50 percentage that we might see with the diorite. So you can see the essential 
ingredients there, the recipe, uh, the minor ingredients, and it's going to have more plaids than case bar. Case bar, remember, usually shows up in a lot of rocks as kind of pinkish or peachy colored. Plaids is that kind of straight white uh, feldspar. And so those are some important things to think about there. So we've got granite, granodiorite, diorite. And then the last one we'll look at here is our mafic intrusive rock, mainly dark minerals. Uh, this is gabbro. And so gabbro is this, the intrusive equivalent of basalt. So if a, if, a, if a magma body, a mafic magma body, stays underground and cools very slowly and crystallizes, uh, rather than forming a basalt when it erupts, it'll form this intrusive igneous rock known as gabbro. And so this will have uh, plaid in it, olivine, pyroxene. Um, we're kind of fudging a little bit on plaid. If you deep dive into plaid a little bit more, you know it has a couple of varieties. There's calcium rich and sodium rich. By the time you get to gabbro, you're probably emphasizing the calcium rich plagioclase, which tends to be a little bit darker. So, so that's all the boring words. Uh, let's look at some, some fun rock samples here. Um, I picked a few that I thought were pretty good examples. Uh, but these are mostly all collected by me and so i could be off a little bit here so if there's an igneous petrologist watching and i screw up then uh, i apologize but these are what i would call at least granitic rocks if not granite so we can see uh, the case bar in here the peachy colored material there we've got some quartz in here that kind of forms these kind of light gray somewhat translucent to colorless crystals um, little bits of plage in here as well the white and then we can see the little black specks in here, mostly biotite, these little shiny, there's one right there, right here, this little shiny face of biotite, that little mica crystal there. Remember that all the reflective surfaces we're seeing as I rotate the sample uh, are all cleavage planes. So whenever you see a little shiny surface kind of come and go, that's telling you that specific mineral has cleavage planes. So there's uh, an example of a, of a nice granite. Um, couple other ones that I thought were pretty good. Um, notice the grain size here might be a little bit smaller, so the crystals are a little smaller, but they're still uh, above the minimum, you know, one millimeter, they're interlocking. Uh, so we can see, looks like there's some muscovite over here, a little bit shiny, bits of plage forming some of the white, a uh, little bits of case bar in here, and then the quartz as well. So the similar ingredients, but again, not all granites look the same. There can be uh, some variety here. So a couple of them there. And then this one here, which I may have shown before, um, which is really nice because it has this nice big uh, biotite crystal in it. But we can see lots of plage in here. But again, overall, we can see that there's less uh, mafic minerals as opposed to the felsic minerals. The rock is more white or lighter colored than dark, okay? Um, let's go to diorite, and then I'll show you what I think is a pretty good granodiorite as well. So here's just in aggregate some samples of uh, diorite, but we can zoom in here on one particular one. We can see some of these nice rectangular amphibole crystals in here. Again, the white. Notice we're not seeing as much of the kind of uh, smoky gray translucent quartz. In fact, as I look at this with the eyeball, I really don't see any quartz in this at all. It looks like it's mainly dominated by uh, plage and uh, hornblende, but there could be a couple other minerals in there as well. Um, this is the example, this is a good example of kind of like the, the black and white salt and pepper kind of look here, right? So it's about 50% plage, 50% dark colored minerals, more or less a, a good mix of the two. So this is when you know you're kind of entering the diorite range is when you're seeing this kind of even split between uh, light and dark colored felsic and mafic minerals. Uh, this is one I got just this summer up in the Pioneer Mountains. Um, I think it's a pretty solid diorite uh, sample as well. Again, the white and, and dark ones in there as well. I'm going to line all these up here in a minute to just kind of show you the sort of spectrum. This is what I'm hoping, and someone will, I'm sure, correct me because it's the internet, that's what happens. Um, but I thought this one was a pretty good example of a granodiorite. Got a little bit of quartz in it still, but overall it looks like it's got more mafix in it. And so it's a little bit, uh, got a little bit more dark, uh, kind of a hue to it because of these, these mafic minerals. So if I take a sample of each of these and kind of line these up, 
uh, I'm hoping you can kind of see the spectrum here, right? From mostly felsic or light colored minerals in the granite to, there is a little bit overall gray color here, but, um, but a little bit more mafix in terms of percentage in our granodiorite. Uh, and then finally over here in our diorite, it's about a 50-50 blend of the mafic to felsic minerals in that one. So hopefully that was kind of helpful. And then our last one here are the gabbros. Um, we've got two samples here. Um, so these are very dark colored, obviously. They have a little bit of plage, but you can see that overall there's more mafic minerals, dark colored minerals in there than light colored minerals. And the rock presents itself as being kind of dark colored. Um, you can see some of these little flashes of light at different places in the rock when I rotate it. So again, those are the cleavage planes. So we're probably seeing uh, some of the, uh, probably pyroxene in some of these here. That's one of the essential ingredients. These ones aren't showing much of the olivine, but you can get into uh, gabbros like this one where you're starting to see a little bit more of that kind of greenish hue might be coming through from some of the olivine. Um, that's a weathered surface there. So let's kind of stick. That's a nice fresh side right there. Um, but yeah, you can see some of these big cleavage planes kind of rotating in the light, a little bit of plage. And so these are what the, um, the gabbros tend to look like, something like that. So real quick, I'll line one of, one of each up so you can kind of see the full spectrum there from, again, felsic granite to in between felsic and intermediate granodiorite to intermediate diorite and to the mafic over here end of the spectrum with gabbro. So kind of a nice spectrum there going from felsic to mafic with our intrusive igneous rocks. Um, remember that these will have extrusive equivalents. And so as we move forward with our next couple videos on volcanic or extrusive igneous rocks, we'll be looking at the equivalents of all of these. So what happens if this type of magma erupts from a volcano? Uh, that would give us a rhyolite. So we'll spend some time on rhyolites. This rock, if it erupts from a volcano and cools quicker and the crystals are smaller, that'll give us a dacite. We'll look at that. Uh, the diorite's equivalent is andesite. So we'll look at that in the coming weeks. And as I mentioned before, the gabbro's equivalent is basalt. And so this is what happens when those uh, magma types stay underground for long periods of time, forming larger crystals, cooling slowly, as we end up with these beautiful a selection of intrusive igneous rocks. So wish I could have uh, wowed you with more names and fancy stuff, but that's that's the Wilsey way, at least with the intrusive rocks. Hopefully that was helpful uh, in and of itself. Uh, appreciate everyone that's given me comments and feedback on these. Hopefully that's helpful. We'll put together another one of these next week. Um, and we'll do at least a couple, I think, on the volcanic or the extrusive rocks, because I do have more knowledge and more samples to share. Uh, with you then. So for now, we'll wrap it up with the intrusive rocks here at the College of Southern Idaho.